It's now a great pleasure to introduce Paul Thompson, who's Director of the European Department at the International Monetary Fund. He's been in that role for the last five years, and before that he was the Deputy Director for Europe uh, at the IMF. He had the uh, very interesting experience of being responsible for the IMF's uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis the program uh, countries in the context of the Eurozone debt crisis. And before that, uh, equally interesting experience uh, during the 1980s and 90s, where for many years he was operating in Central Eastern Europe and in Russia at the time of the transition before and after the fall of the wall. So no better person really to understand not only the domestic and immediate context of the European economy, but also the wider international setting. So over to Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much and good afternoon uh, to all of you and thank you for coming here uh, this afternoon for our launch of our uh, regional economic outlook for, for Europe. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, I will of course like to thank uh, Anthony Teasdale uh, 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 for hosting us uh, today and, and Enot Mercaras, uh, Vice, Vice President uh, for, of the Parliament, for his opening remarks. Particularly grateful for Robert Holtzman, uh, Governor of the Austrian Central Bank, and for Maria de Merzis uh, from Bruegel for having joined us as discussions. So let's get started, but one caveat up front. The European Department of the IMF covers 44 countries. You can see them on the map out there. This is not a very homogeneous group of countries. They're facing many different challenges, and it's always somewhat of, of, of a difficulty to, to try to extract some common theme. I will obviously leave out much of, of, of what's important for individual uh, countries. Let me start with, uh, with the key messages. Uh, we are currently in a synchronized global slowdown, and Europe is no exception. As in the rest of the world, manufacturing and trade has weakened considerably. Europe's weaker growth is primarily due to export, but some signs of softer investment have started to appear. Consumption has been relatively uh, resilient so far, reflecting still very strong labor markets in most European countries. Advanced European economies have weakened more than uh, emerging Europe outside Russia and Turkey, uh, which have so far been not significantly affected by the global slowdown. Looking forward, we expect a modest recovery in 2020, driven uh, by a projected rebound in external trade. But this recovery, as we will discuss, is clearly subject uh, to some downside risk. Against this backdrop, we do support the continued accommodate monetary policy stance of the ECB, but with a, certainly with a cautioning note of heightened vigilance about potential side effect. As unemployment is near or below pre-crisis level in most countries, despite the recent weakening, we are, as far as fiscal policy is concerned, telling countries that they should be guided by medium-term objective, meaning that countries that need to build fiscal space to reduce debt should continue to do so in the current environment. We also say in countries that have fiscal space and that need to boost, that they can boost growth to, uh, potential growth to additional measures, uh, would be a good time to do that now. Uh, let me start with a quick look at uh, what has been happening to economic activity. EU economies have very closely followed global trends. As you can see from this chart on the left, trade is weak. And as you see from the middle chart, so is manufacturing. And here you see how closely uh, developments in here in the numbers for the EU are following uh, uh, developments uh, 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 in the world as, f as far as both export volumes and uh, industrial production are concerned. From the bar chart on the right, you can see that vehicles and machinery in red and orange are driving much of the production slum in the region. Now the key question, of course, is whether the weakness in, Europe, in Europe's industry and trade will spread to the rest of the European economy. To, to discuss this, I would like to show you two slides. First, the chart on the left. 
which shows the supply side sectorial composition of growth. You'll see it confirms that the slowdown is mainly driven by the industrial sector, here in orange. This slide, by the way, covers all of Europe, not only the EU. You will see that while services in blue have been more resil resilient, they have also started to soften somewhat. If you look at the, at the right, you see that the purchasing uh, managers indices for, indices for EU countries confirms this picture with a significant slow uh, negative development for manufacturing, but also clearly a weakening for, for services. The second slide I want to show you here shows the economy from the demand side. Consistent with the weak external demand, much of the slowdown in Europe outside Russia and Turkey is still driven by weak net export, in orange in the left chart. In addition, business confidence is falling sharply and uncertainty is rising, as you can see from the chart on the right. In line with this, and now I'm going back to the chart on the left, you see that investments, which is in yellow here, investments is beginning to be affected. On the other hand, private consumption in dark blue, which accounts for the largest share of the economy, has been relatively robust. Preliminary data for the third quarter of this year confirm these trends. Preliminary data for France, Italy, and Spain are actually somewhat better than we expected because of the resilience of domestic demand. Going forward, the key question is thus whether the relative resilience of domestic uh, consumption will persist. This hinges critically on labor markets. Unemployment rates are currently near or below pre-crisis level in most EU economies, despite the slowdown in activity that we have seen, the slowdown in growth that we have seen. Labor shortages, especially for skilled people, prevail in many countries. Consistent with this, wage growth has generally held up and is still strong in the EU, in the new, in the new member countries in the, in the EU. You can see this from the chart here on the left. The higher incomes that workers are receiving has supported private consumption on the demand side and services on the supply side. That being said, there are some signs of weaker labor markets emerging. The chart on the right shows changes in job vacancies in the EU economies, an indicator of firms' hiring appetite. Not surprisingly, with what, given what I have said, uh, this appetite is now falling clearly in the manufacturing sector. But even for the overall economy, as you can see, vacancy growth has slowed. Firms are obviously becoming more careful about hiring, which could dampen consumption going forward. Nevertheless, overall, as I said, labor markets remain very strong uh, in, uh, in some important economies at, at uh, historically highs. Quick look at how different country groups performed in this environment. As you can see from the chart here on the left, the slowdown was most evident in advanced Europe. While in emerging Europe, excluding Russia and Turkey, growth continued to hold up uh, well in the first half of 2019. This is important. Global headwinds have so far not had a major impact on emerging Europe outside Russia and Turkey. Will this continue? Our analysis suggests that historically, emerging Europe growth has been affected by advanced Europe. Hence, while emerging Europe's still considerable scope for catch-up gain uh, suggests robust growth rates ahead, we should, ex we should expect that the current decoupling will not last. Against this background, let me turn to our forecast. As mentioned, there are signs that the contraction in trade and manufacturing is beginning to spread to investment and services. However, we envisage that a recovery in global trade will limit these adverse dynamics. This is critical. We assume no hard Brexit and no further intensification of trade restriction. On the contrary, 
we assume that there will be a pickup in trade growth from this year's unusually weak levels. Not a significant one, but nevertheless a pickup. Reflecting this, we pro project a 10 years recovery in advanced Europe in 2020. As to emerging Europe, again excluding Turkey and Russia, growth is forecast to moderate this in next year. This reflects lagged spillovers, as I discussed, from advanced Europe, as well as the, con the, the convergence to a more sustainable growth rate, as these economies have been growing well above capacity for a number of years. Finally, from Russia and Turkey, as you can see, we expect a bounce back next year as they recover from recent lows. As this recovery hinges on a pickup in external trade, which has not yet materialized, it is not surprising that I am telling you that we are concerned about risks. The main ones include, of course, increasing protectionism, a sudden rise in risk premia, a further buildup of financial vulnerabilities, and rising geopolitical tensions. I think you're all familiar with this, and I will not go into any detail. Uh, many of them are common across the globe. Let me just say from a European perspective, of course, we remain especially concerned about a disorderly Brexit. Although the chances of this happening might have declined, this is still a risk, and such an event would have a serious impact, especially on the UK, obviously, but also on the EU. In short, given the risks as we see them, I think it's fair to say that if we come here in half a year, we're more likely to revise down than revise up. Okay. Before turning to the policy implications of this outlook, as I have described it, let me say a few words on the cyclical position of the European economies. Let me point out a bit of a dilemma that faces us when we advise policies, advise policymakers. On this map, dark green means that output is well above a country's full employment level. Light green denotes countries with output around the full employment level. Orange depicts countries somewhat below, and red means countries significantly below. This is the picture from 2008. There is a lot of green here, a lot of dark green, but generally Europe is very green. Now you see the picture for 2019 uh, on, the, on the right, and you will see that there is obviously less dark green, but it's still pretty green. So in terms of uh, you know, what we call output gap, uh, Europe is, 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 is still operating in Europe at large at or close to full capacity, and in some cases above. Now, I have a different map which is less, com less comforting. This map shows the change in growth rates between 19 and 18. Green, green denotes higher growth compared to last year. Light orange denotes a slowdown smaller than three quarter of a percentage point. Orange denotes a slowdown between three quarter and one and a half percentage point. And red means that the uh, 19 growth is projected to be more than one and a half percentage point lower than 2018. Here you see a different picture. So clearly, no, it, it is a slowing economy. But as we see from the first picture, in many places, this just means that they are growing less above potential than before. Output gaps are closing from above. This map summarizes somewhat of a policy dilemma. Uh, much of Europe is still operating around capacity, according to several indicators, but it is slowing and the projected recovery is tenuous. So what are the policy implications here? Let me start with monetary policy. As you can see from the chart on the left, and I think this is all familiar to you, inflation shown by the bars remains well below target, shown by the dots. And in some cases, we indicate that the inflation target is a range. Uh, in most countries, both in advanced and in, 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 in emerging uh, uh, Europe. In light of that, we do support a continued accommodating monetary policy stance in most European countries. Regarding the ECB in particular, given the uncertainty, we understand the recent further easing of monetary policy. At the same time, 
it's clearly legitimate to be concerned about potential adverse side effects of continuing to step on the monetary accelerator. We welcome, therefore, the review of the monetary uh, uh, framework and, and clearly a need for heightened, heightened vigilance about financial uh, vulnerabilities. So far, we have not seen significant no, negative side effect. Yes, there are some housing markets that are, that are becoming relatively hot, but it's local phenomena and we think that macro credential tools can be employed to deal with them. But we do accept that given the significant uncertainty that there is around in, uh, you know, what's driving prices, given the uncertainty it, it, there is around this big structural shift in the world economy, globalization, labor market uh, movements and how they affect prices, we have seen how difficult it is to get inflation up. Given that uncertainty, clearly there is a need to be very, very vigilant about the side effect of, of a monetary policy that pushes for inflation to get up to, to, to uh, 2 percent. What about fiscal policy? Let me summarize the pros and cons of discretionary fiscal relaxation. Factors that argue for a, a looser fiscal stance include, as we have discussed, a weak outlook and substantial downside risks. The fact that monetary policy is approaching its limits, I'm not saying it is at its limits, but I think most people would agree that it certainly is approaching these limits. The need in some countries to, for significant uh, uh, spending to address supply-side bottlenecks and raise long-term growth. And, of course, the record low government bond yields. On the other hand, factors that argue against loosening include that unemployment rates generally are near levels that prevailed before the global financial crisis or even lower, that we do project the recovery from 2020, and, importantly, that quite a few countries need to build fiscal space because of high debt. And then, of course, there is the possibility that the low deals could be reversed eventually. So where do we come out? Overall, given that the baseline scenario envisages a recovery and that most economies remain at or above full employment, we believe that it is important that fiscal policy continue to be guided by medium-term consideration. We do not see a general need for discretionary relaxation at this juncture. For now, countries should keep the powder dry. This means for countries with high debt and limited fiscal space, the recommendation remains for these countries to continue the fiscal consolidation in 2020. Except in cases, if any, where private demand is already so weak that that consolidation would push output growth far below the full employment level. That's obviously an important caveat. In countries with ample fiscal space like Germany and, and the Netherlands, we continue to see a case for looser fiscal policy to boost medium-term growth to the extent that spending can be directed towards uh, uh, purposes that promises to boost long-term growth. In view of the downside risks that I described, we certainly would also advise countries to have plans for fiscal dis uh, discretionary relaxa uh, relaxation in the draw, in the case that there is uh, that that the negative major negative shock uh, materialized. As I said, this is not we are, we are not in a situation where we would ask for such plans to be taken out of the draw and employed. But I do think that one needs to do that. It is important that such plans, if they, if they are implemented, if they become necessary, are done in a medium-term context, that they are done in a way that does not raise questions about the, the attainability of medium-term fiscal target. That is particularly important for countries with limited fiscal space. If, if they were to, 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 to need discretionary relaxation, that they can do it in a way that will not unsettle markets. Let me just say, uh, uh, before I finish with fiscal policy, 
All of these recommendations would also help to reduce internal uh, imbalances in the Eurozone, in particular reduce the current account deficits in countries with current account surpluses. Uh, in countries, uh, uh, I spend a lifetime dealing with deficits and suddenly it's uh, surpluses. Uh, dealing, you know, this will help bringing down uh, 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 current account uh, uh, surpluses. I have spoken mainly, and too long I can see, about the conjuncture, recent development and the outlook. Let me just leave you with a few words on what I really think, you know, I, what policymakers should, what should keep policymakers awake at night, if you want to put it like that, and where I think we have failed badly for, for a number of years, and that's on structural reforms. Let me start with a success. Look at the chart on the left. This is all I'm going to tell you is about convergence. This shows uh, uh, for the for the, uh, no, uh, the uh, it shows nominal nominal GDP uh, uh, per capita in PPT terms for emerging Europe and for the EU member states. And uh, 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 please bring up the EU member states. Uh, and uh, you know this is this is clearly a success case. I mean the. Uh, this is something we should not forget, particularly now, it's a 30 year anniversary now for the wall coming down, that Eastern Europe has been spectacularly successful and clearly the EU is, deserves much, much of the credit, in addition to the countries themselves, of course, uh, uh, for, for, for this. Uh, uh, and here, uh, I think the challenges are well known. Uh, there's no more long hanging fruits in, in terms of, of productivity growth. The reforms become more about institutional reforms, uh, dealing with corruption and issues like that, which is often more complex. Uh, 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 so there's still some way to go, but so far, I must say, uh, Im impressive. Not so impressive. The two other charts I have to show you. The first one is from the uh, labor productivity per in the Eurozone, where we see that uh, you know, until, until the mid 90s, late 90s, we so see that the countries are all moving, uh, move, moving uh, together. It's one of the things that, that never uh, sees surprising me. You go back 50, 60 years from labor, pro labor productivity, Germany, France, UK, all of them. It's all the same, despite the very different economies. Until we come to the late 90s, where suddenly we see that Italy and Spain start flattening out. And a gap is opens up to the best performing countries in Europe. More recently, with the reform in Spain, Spain has started to catch up also. This is a critical challenge facing Euro area policy makers. But it's not only no, it's not only the weaker countries that are facing challenges. Look at the chart to the left, which shows that even the best performing countries, Germany and France, since the 2000s, have declined relative to the US in terms of labor productivity. So there clearly are challenges all around. I'm not going to go into what these structural reform challenges are. Uh, first of all, I think you're all very familiar with them, and they differ very much from country to country. So I'm just going to leave it like that, but this is just a reminder that Europe faces a number of very serious structural issues that it needs to tackle. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs>